Watch go ahead and be seated because I can just get going. We can not even stop. So, good morning. Welcome to New Life Church. Just in case you were wondering, uh, this is not your normal church. This is not your average church. This is where Jesus comes and we worship him. <laughs> anyway, look at this. I got waters and everything. Thank you, ushers. Anybody feeling good after that worship song? Yeah. You know, I never played drums today, so I decided, I decided that since I was going to be able to worship, I had to dress for a workout. <laughs> Because when I'm out here, boy, I'm telling you, I, Clint, it's a good thing Clint to pick those songs. I might have just danced all over the front because they were all, they were just on this side of Melville. So, so y'all got preserved. Because you've seen your past get all kinds of undignified. <laughs> and like David said, I will get more undignified for him. Amen. We're going, uh, we're going to Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. I'm reading from the NIV. These are very, very familiar scriptures. And uh, I am glad you're here today. For anybody who does want to stay, you're having a business meeting after. And if you don't like business meetings, you'll like the food. So stay, if you want. <laughs> anyway, Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. These are Jesus' last words. They are called the Great Commission. And the Word of God says this. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority. Everyone say that. All authority. All authority. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Given to who? Jesus. Given to Jesus. Okay? So this is what he says next. Therefore, go. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> That's right. I got a preacher with me today. <laughs> Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Everyone say that with me. All nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always. How long? Always. Always. To the very end of the age. Come on. You are never alone, folks. You're never alone. I'm going to talk to you for a little while. For a little while. I hope it's for a little while. Hmm. Our mission as Christians is to disciple nations. To disciple nations. That requires... Then we enter the world and bring transformation. The title of this message is What if God wanted to use you to change the world? What if God wanted to use you? I'm not talking about me. And I'm not talking about Pastor Denise. I'm not talking about Mike and Diane Kowalski. I'm not talking about, you know, Blake and Kelly Barth, I'm not talking about any of our elders or deacons, I'm talking about you, all of you, from the youngest to the oldest, from the newest convert to the oldest saint, what if God wanted to use you to change the world? So many times we, we come to church and we, we talk about the Lord and and, and we, it's important that we understand that, that God is always creating opportunities for us to engage with Him so that He can bring us to the next dimension. He can bring us that next step. He can take us where we've never been before. And, and today I just want to, I want us to, to just go forward. History is dotted with men and women that God decided to use change the world. The Bible, of course, is full of them. We can go talk about Abraham, talk about Moses, talk about David, and of course, the Lord Jesus himself. But, but how about this? Those, those stories, those people are, are captured in a book, and we 
we understand that we have their story or at least parts of it between these, these leather bound pages but, but what about the history of the world? Did you know that, that history is dotted with advancements in humanity made by people who made Jesus king? Sir Isaac Newton changed the world when he discovered physics as a mathematician. Florence Nightingale, the mother of modern nursing, had her mission determined before her by the cause of Christ. Abraham Lincoln, perhaps the greatest leader outside of maybe George Washington this nation has ever had, kept this nation together, binding it together as one nation under God, understanding that this nation had a destiny that was bigger than merely just being a, a global political power, but it was here to be a, a beacon of light of the glory of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. For those of you who don't maybe know world history very well, a man named William Wilberforce was the one who was an abolitionist in the United Kingdom, who was the first one for years as a legislator in the House of Commons. He would petition annually for a law to be passed that would outlaw slavery, and that man beat that door every day, every day, every year. He marching down the offices of the House of Commons and the House of Lords, knocking to see if he could talk to the, that representative, that, that lord, or that common man who was there representing their district. He came to them time and time again, and one week before he died, the United Kingdom outlawed slavery. But the reason that he was an abolitionist, the reason that he was fighting for the rights of people that were under oppression is because he knew that Jesus said that he was a savior to those that have made the, the captives free. Yeah. That he whom the Son has set free is free indeed. And that it is for freedom that Christ set you free, Galatians 5.1. That was the driver of William Force. William Carey, the first missionary in the modern era, in the 1850s, died in India after years of just plowing the field and translating the Bible. From what I understand, it was 25 years, imagine this, 25 years, God had called him to, to India to be a missionary. He goes literally halfway around the world from his home in the United Kingdom. And after 25 years, he had translated the Bible into the Indian language, I think it was Urdu that he translated it into, and he had one convert. But today, you can go to India, and there are whole areas that are completely Christian, that they beam with the glory of God, with the gospel of Jesus Christ, because one man decided to change the world. So how are you called to change the world? What are you called to do? See, what's awesome about being a child of God is that if you have been saved, can I tell you something? You are a world changer. Right. You sound like this. That was a very polite little golf clap. <laughs> you see, God, God, his children into the world to change it. That's why he tells the disciples to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. We're not just simply here to just simply have a nice little church service. I am not here to just have a good little church. I'm not here to count how much money was given or anything else. You know that I don't even know what y'all give. I don't know who gives what. Because I don't care. What I care about is what matters most. I care that we become the people that God created us to be. So that we begin to shine the way that we're supposed to. That we can become the church that we're called to be. That this, this, this little church on a hill outside of Camp, between Camp and Troy, can all of a sudden step into a place that we begin to shift world powers because we decided to change.
me, I am playing. I am out, I am on the war, war, war hunt today. I told the guys in the back room as we were preparing, I haven't felt this way in, in a long time. Blake, you'll know how I feel. I, I, the boys will too. Gage and Ryan, right before kickoff, especially if you're returning the ball, if you're the, if you're the set man back and the whistle's about to blow and they're about to kick that ball, that's how I feel. I'm like, give me the ball, honey. Because I'm gonna run it down your throat. Yes. 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 See, the capacity is this. It is not because your little pastor is a little inspired to you. It's not just because I'm in a good mood and fired up. Because unlike any other contest in the history of the world, I already know who wins. And I already know that we've got a, a, a group of people, i got about 200 people I'm looking at right now, that God is desiring to put on the field TV. The amazing thing about the kingdom of God is that it's not just the top 11 who get to play. On a football team, you've got to be one of the top 11 players to play, and you've got to be one of the best in your position, and there's 11 different positions, basically. But you've got to be one of the best to get on the field. Do you know what's awesome about the Lord? He gave you his spirit. And that means in your position, there ain't nobody better. Right. Right. And all you got to do is just find out where you fit. You just find out what your name is. And all of a sudden, we all get on the field. We all get to play. You know what? It's crazy to see. When, when a team wins a major victory, and, and, and all the fans run on the field, they, want, they run on the field because they want to be part. Can I tell you whether you stand on this platform ever, whether you ever hold this microphone or any other, it does not matter your part. We are the body of Christ. <clears throat> See, but to begin to, to step into those things, I, 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 I want to challenge you. I want you to, to first and foremost, I want you to have permission to dream. Yeah. So many times I've, I, I, I've talked to people in this area, and, and it seems like, and this is not just here, it's, it's people. We, we look in the mirror and we go, yeah, but I'm only, you know, this, and I'm only that, and I'm only this smart, and, you know, I'm, I'm pretty smart, but, but there's all these people who are way smarter than me, and, and then, or, or, or I'm athletic, but maybe not as athletic. And we, we, we limit ourselves. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. I want you to have permission. I want you to, to dream just out of the box. I, I, I heard something really cool. It was, on a, it was a Jeep commercial yesterday that I saw during the football game I was watching. And I won't mention the one. Yeah. <laughs> this, this man starts talking to me. He says, he says, you know, we talk about the American dream. And he said, you ever notice it wasn't the American goal? He said, because, because a goal is something that you can achieve, whereas a dream is so much bigger than that. I want to give you permission to have a dream. I want to give you permission to have a dream of what God wants to do with you. I want you to begin to think about what, what is God really, what would I do if I, if I just had no limits? Sometimes I play the game in my mind, what, what would I do if someone just dumped two million dollars on me? What would I do? And I start thinking. Or what would I do if somebody won the lottery and they tied it to me? <laughs> for the record, we would receive that tithe and rejoice all the way. Because we would use it for the king. But that's a whole other thing. What would I do? And when I pulled the cork off 
of my little live, when I, when I elevate my thinking past what my goals are, past what I can do by my own intuition and by my own drive and by my own power, by my own initiative, when I move past what I can do and I start to think about what would I do? What would I do if God gave me a blank check? What would I do if, if, if God just said do whatever you want? And I start thinking in that way, all of a sudden I start dreaming different things. I'm not just dreaming about New Life Church being packed. I'm dreaming about our prayer meetings transforming this region. Yeah. I'm dreaming about the Baptist Cessationist Church down the road having the Holy Ghost fall and watching them just crumble under the power of the Spirit. That's miracles that happen from door to back and that they are seeing God under the power. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm a little bit of trouble. See, I want to give you permission to dream. Because God, when you start to dream, God can begin to move. Scripture says that without a vision, the people perish. Y'all know that finishing. What do the people do without a vision? Perish. They perish. That means, that means until we see something that's beyond us. We're doing nothing but spinning our wheels. All of our work is going to less than what God intends it to do. We need to start dreaming his dreams. We need to start believing for the impossible. We need to start believing, Archie, that on a Friday night in the middle of the volleyball game that Jesus can show up and begin to just move in power. Wherever Zico says, I want to say that in the middle of a basketball game, in the middle of a dribble, Boy, just fall out in the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Wouldn't that be fun? Yeah. I think it'd be fun. <laughs> See, but we got to start seeing things beyond our experience or we'll always be limited by what we've done. Yeah. God is wanting for us to dream big. Yeah. Right now, for all of us, I will say this, for all of our um, Troy Trojans, congratulations on an amazing season. Kick butt, take names in the playoffs, go do it. Um, to the Camp Warriors, I just want to say good luck to you in the playoffs. Right now, for both teams, they're experiencing amazing things. These are great days. I was part of the program coaching on the football team when, when we were not winning every game we played, let's just say. And these are amazing times, but I want you to hear me. There are people in, in Gage and Ryan, and you're not going to be this, these men. Because there are men across the country that today are talking about the glory days 50 years ago. Sitting at bars, tipping up alcoholic beverages, saying, yeah, remember that one game? Oh my. You know? Quarterback threw for 300 yards, you know? When we talk about those things, and those, those, those for so many people are their best days. I declare over you, and I declare over every athlete, every high school athlete in this house, everybody who has glory days in the past, whether it be in the Marines, or in Airborne, or in some other branch of service, or whatever it was that you have had glory, and you have shown above your peers, and you think that all of those were the good old days. Let me tell you.
strength and conditioning coach at Canton, and he was skinny. He was a decent athlete, but he wasn't real strong. But he decided, this is the thing, he made two decisions that I was privy to. He decided that he wanted to be a Canton Warrior football player. And then he did the most important decision is after that one, after deciding to become, he decided to work his tail off. And that skinny little boy that walked into my weight room, he is neither little nor skinny any longer. <laughs> he is a man. And see, the thing is, guys, what we need to understand is that that's what it takes. That's all it takes. For anybody who wants what I'm talking about right now, that's all it takes is a decision and then a determination to go forward. And if you do those two things, God's going to bring you forward and use you in power. So what are your dreams? What are you born to do? Whatever it is, whatever it is, God created you to change your life. Yes. Guys, this is the bad news. I'm not even, I'm, I'm not even done my introduction. <laughs> uh, it's a good thing I wore my workout stuff because this is going to be a while. No, this is the thing. Bear with me. Bear with me. Because this is the thing. If you catch this, as soon as you get this, we can be done. But this is one of the most important lessons I've ever preached to because this is the thing, we've, we've come to this point. For anybody who's been here for seven years or longer, we have worked hard to get here. It has been a struggle. If you've just come in the last year or two, we don't need this place for you. It, it, this is like a luxury liner compared to what we had seven years ago. See, but the thing is this, we have built this place as a body, with members of the body of Christ rising up to grab hold of God's promises in their lives. We let people become department heads and, and ministry leaders that before that were, were very successful in other areas of life, but they stepped into leadership here. And they have decided that they are going to put their effort not just in their career and not just in their children, but in this place to create an environment where people can come and find Jesus. Because if you found Jesus here in the last three years, put your hand, just raise your hand right now. It's a lot of on this side. It's all right. There's a few more that didn't raise their hand, they're shy, it's all right. I see you, I won't bust you out. See, but this is the thing. You like church exists to make disciples of Jesus Christ to change their world. That is the mission of this church. And what's awesome is that God's doing it. See, but how I know, how I know, how I know that you are called to change the world, change your world. See, that word is very, is very specific. There's, we let church exist to make disciples of Jesus Christ to change their world. You have a world to change. And I don't know what it is, but I know this. I know that you are created to change the world. Why? Because God created you to reign. When you, when you reign, what I mean by that is you bring God into the sphere of influence that you are supposed to walk in. See, God always raises up his people to shine. There's a scripture that says that you are the light of the world. A city set upon a hill cannot be hidden. We are the ones who are called to shine. God desires us to be a reflection of his glory and of his kingdom. The king, excuse me, the uh, 
NIV of Revelation 5.10 says this. This is speaking of Jesus. It says, you have made them, meaning us. Say, that means me. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. See, we are called to reign. We are called to reign. That's not pride. That's not elitism. We're not saying that we're better than everybody else. What we are saying is that the world needs us to live, to lead, and to reign so that they can find the peace and the wholeness that we have discovered. This is not about some, this is, this is not a motivational speech. I'm not here to pump you up and say you can do it. I'm here to tell you that when you step into the place that God created you to fulfill, that means that he's going to move through you to bring his kingdom into that environment. And God's going to change lives because you're there. Kings have thrones. And your throne is your, is, is just your sphere of influence. When you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, it says, We, this is Paul writing to the church, we, however, will not boast, hear this, beyond our proper limits, but will continue our boasting to the sphere of service that God himself has assigned us, a sphere that also includes you. See, when you find out where it is you're called to be, then all of a sudden, that sphere is where you bring the kingdom. When God called me here, you became part of my sphere. I'm called to bring the kingdom here. I'm called to help you rise into the place where you discover the places that God has for you to reign so that you can step into your kingdom and begin to bring life there. Because that's all this is. That's all this is. I sat across the table from a, from a lady this week who's been going through some things and we were talking about churches and she had a very bad experience in church and, and I said what makes a church a church is the presence of the living God it is the life of Jesus Christ and see what's happening guys is God wants us to blow up our vision he wants to blow up our understanding where it's not just about getting people here to church but that you understand that when you walk into the room, you are the church. That when you walk into the room, the kingdom of God just came. And that anything that God needs to do, he can do with you. We need to really grasp these things. Because your sphere has a throne. And you are called, hear this, you are called to be the one who reigns there. That means that if there's another, if you just happen to go to work and there's a witch that's there, and she's got all of her little stuff, let me just tell you, when you walk into the room, all the power bows to the spirit beside you, because that's the Holy Spirit. And nothing can stand against that. I've seen witches pray through the Holy Ghost. Who? They said that when they were crying and praying, the Holy Ghost was speaking through them. After they're done, their they're makeup all running down their face. And they're, they're completely, they go from being the depressed, ugly spirited person to the light of Jesus Christ shining in them. And all of a sudden they go, in all the things I've ever done, in everything I ever thought, in all the, the, the delving into witchcraft and mysticism I ever tried, this is what I was looking for. You don't know. You don't know where you're going to impact. But see, God, God wants you to begin to step into your place so that he can begin to move. Right. See, this is the thing. Some of us, hear this, some of us right now, we've been waiting for God to do something with us. But that's the problem. Too many times we've got believers and we have this crummy theology. And I'm, I'm fixing to get some of you irritated with me right now, but that's all right. We go, well, brother, God's in control. 
If God was in control, the whole world would be saved. Everything, there'd be peace in, in the world. Nations wouldn't be fighting nations. We wouldn't be worried about a possible nuclear war coming. If God was in control. See, because if God can't control you, how does he control the world? He controls the world only when he has control of his people. And his people begin to move in the direction that they're called to. And they begin to fulfill their places in the kingdom of God. Then all of a sudden, he can start to have some control. But until he has control of you. If you're his kingdom, if you are his kings, and he doesn't rule in your life, how much control does he have? That's why it does matter how you think. That's why it does matter what you do, what you think, what you say. It does matter. Because because the further you move outside of his reign, the less he can use you. And God is just hearing. Can I tell you right now? You in your life, wherever you are, whatever you've seen, whatever God's done, I want to tell you that right now, whatever God's been able to do with you, it has been limited by how well he reigns in your life. So we, we enter into our reign in two ways. We grow. And we remain faithful. We grow spiritually and we remain faithful. We, we, in the midst of struggles, we remain faithful. Because nobody, hear this, nobody gets saved and enters into rain in one step. Look at Jesus. God in flesh is born. He, he grows and, and becomes a man. He goes through 30 years of life perfectly submitted to God's law. And then he gets baptized and the Holy Spirit comes upon him. And he's immediately thrown out into the wilderness. You all know the story. See, but the, the, the story of Jesus' life is that he always did what he saw the faithful, excuse me, he always did what he saw the Father do. And that always allowed, because there's rain, God to move through. God wants to raise you up. God wants to raise you up. God wants to raise you up. And I know you think it's not fair that I brought up Jesus. So let me just bring it back from someone who's not God in the flesh. David. David was faithful. See, God, God has, and I want you to hear this, and this is really where I want to get to, because I want to, I'm not just here to inspire you. That's what evangelists do. And, and I'm not an evangelist here. This is my church. I pastor you now. So I got to teach you something. That's kind of funny. <laughs> you, are, as a child of God, there's up to three anointings that come in your life. And I know that because this is a pattern of, of God in the scriptures, but it, it's highlighted in David. David is a young man, he's a boy, he's a shepherd boy in the, in the field, right? And they're looking, God has said, and said Samuel, that there's going to be a new king. Does anybody know this story? There's going to be a new king, he's going to be one of Jesse's sons. And so Jesse's sons are all there, and they're handsome, and they're big, and they're strong, and they're athletic, and they're, 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 they're the picture of manhood. To the point that, that, that Samuel sees a big dad, David's oldest brother, and says, Clearly, this is the Lord's anointing. I mean, look at him. He's handsome. He's strong. He's all those things. And, and the Lord says, don't look at the outside. Look at what I'm looking at, which is the heart. He goes all the way down the list and finds David. And suddenly, David's called out of the field. And he's anointed. He's put oil on his head. And he's declared to be the king of Israel. That's his first anointing. And I want you to hear this. That's the beginning. That's the beginning of his anointing. The second anointing comes when he's made king over Judah and Hebrew. So he's made a king over part of his promise. And then 
The third anointing comes when he's made king over Israel. He has his second throne, which is now a world power. Now, I want you to understand this. God is always going to start at the beginning. When you got saved, when you received Jesus as your Savior, when you received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, God gave you His Spirit. The oil of His presence came into your life, and you were anointed, hear this, to be a king. You were anointed for a throne. Even if you're still just a shepherd. Even if you're just still dealing with stinky sheep. Even if you were still on the back side of the desert, don't do me in. God knows you. And he knows where you're going. See, God, though, is, is then in process and bringing you to the place where you are getting built up, matured, and you remain faithful in the midst of the struggles so that you are able to sit on the throne in integrity. You're going to have, you're going to have a, a first throne before you have your pinnacle call. You will always reign over less before you get it all. <coughs> but as you keep on going and as you keep on being grown up in God and you keep on being faithful, God brings you to the place. Where you end up in your ultimate calling. And I'm, I'm, I'm really compressing a lot of things because I'm going somewhere. And you need to hear me right now. God is taking you somewhere. God is taking you somewhere. And he knows where it is. And you may have no clue. You may not have any idea what it is. And you may feel like, maybe you're that person I mentioned in the beginning of service. And it feels like you're in this maze and you just on running into dead ends, but I want to tell you something. God knows where he's taking you. Yeah. There's been a lot of times my wife and I have not known where we're going next, but God just kept on leading, and we just kept on walking, and there were a lot of times <laughs> I could tell you stories. <laughs> but God just kept on leading, and we just kept on walking. So I want you to hear me now. You've got somewhere you're going. You've got a place that God's calling you to. But that does not mean that we're with you. And this is really what I came to say right now. Because a lot of times, we as believers are waiting for the moment. We're waiting for that, that moment where God, you know, catapults us out. And, and all of a sudden, you know, God's going to do great things. I remember there was a lady that I knew was from my home church in Wisconsin, and she, she felt like she was called to, to be the wife of a very famous evangelist. And she was just waiting for that evangelist to call her one day. I'm like, well, have you ever met Brother Stone King? That's his name, Stone King. Have you ever met Brother Stone King? Well, no, we've never met. Well, honey, you better get meet him. Because I doubt he's going to know who to call. He hasn't mentioned yet. And we, we, we are like that. We keep waiting for God to do something to bring us out of this place that we think we're in. We're just, oh, God's going to do this with me someday. Well, honey, what are you doing to get there? How are you, how are you, are you moving forward? David, hear this, David's greatest victories the things we know him about, most of those were happening before he was ever made king. Think about that. If he was waiting to step into the throne before he met Goliath on the battlefield, Israel would have been destroyed. You see, God wants to kick us out of our comfort zone. He wants to move us past the things that we think we know, that, oh, I just can't do that, and I can't do this. One thing you need to know in working with me, as your pastor, I will say yes. If you say, I feel like we need to go do something, we need to go, go, God's calling us to go do something, I will say yes. God's kitchen is an example. 
We're also going to pray for a couple right now that God spoke in their heart a while ago. And they've been just, they've been working with, with the youth and taking them out to, to minister to the homeless and stuff. And this has become like a real ministry. It's called 22-9. But what 
are you called to? Where is your sphere that you're supposed to move into and bring Jesus? See, because that's the thing, guys. We get all wrapped up in, in all this king language, and, and it, 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 it sounds just so full of ourselves, but it is absolutely not. Jesus said that he didn't come to be served. He came to serve. The king of glory himself did not come so that we would just simply serve him. He came to serve us. And when we understand that that's how this kingdom works, it's not about big eyes and little views. It's about us. It's about us stepping into our place. It's about us stepping into the areas of, of life that God wants each of us to step into. It's about us fulfilling our role and bringing the kingdom of God there. See, when that happens, when that happens, when that happens, we will absolutely change the world. There are people in this room that are called to be missionaries. There are people in this room that are called to be missionaries overseas and do amazing things there. There are some of you that are called to be missionaries in schools, in courthouses. There are some of you that are called to be missionaries you know, building houses, working on plumbing, electric. There's, there's some of you that are called to be the pastors, those who, who work on farms. In this room right now, we have so many people that are called to these things, but this is the thing I want you to think of. Where is God calling you? Where is God calling you? Because this is the thing. We can talk about all these ideas. We can mention all these wonderful concepts. But until we step into the place we're called to, we will never change anything. Until you're anointed, hear this. Until you're anointing what God has given you, the gift that you are, until you bring change to the world somehow, it's unrealized potential. And God did not make you that. He made you a sword to unsheath. He made you a light to bring clarity in darkness. Guys, the moment you begin to step into that place, you need to hear me. The reason, that reason, the reason that God has not used some of you in miracles and that you've not seen a lot of great things happen is simply because you've not stepped into the place that you need them. God's waiting. God's waiting. He wants to give you these things. But until you step into the place where you are stepping in to be his ambassador, until you step in to be the one who rules and represents him in this area, until you step into that place and you begin to pull on his power, there's no need for it. Then it's just, then it's just a good party moment. It's just a little trip. Jesus has many tricks. The devil's many tricks. He gives power indiscriminately. Then, of course, he charges you for it later. Jesus gives it freely, but it's got to be out of heart, sir. Someday. Today I want to just pray for you. I want to pray that you dream. I want to pray that you dream big dreams. And you begin to ask God, what are you dreaming for me? But I also want to pray that you get just the heart of a servant. That you would that you would just desire to just bring this kingdom to people who don't. So many times we think, oh, then we're Jeff Gordon. But see, we got to give him a chance. I, uh, well, I just say this. Sometimes, sometimes if we don't take our shot, we lose our shot. I, uh, 
I went to Connecticut this week. I had to deal with some things that were going on. And um, it's funny, on the way into Connecticut, I was, I was praying and talking to the Lord. And um, for whatever reason, uh, an old family friend came to mind. They lived right down the street from me. They, uh, they'd be the ones to be able to tell you about all the times when I was a little kid and all the silly things I did. How I used to ride my, my bike around, town, around our neighborhood with a, a towel, like safety pin to my neck because I was Batman. <laughs> or Superman. Or possibly, you know, Captain America, even though he didn't have a. You had to distinguish, I had to distinguish I was a superhero. I mean, even though Captain wear a, a cape, I was, they know I was a superhero, but now a cape on. Uh, maybe I'll tell you all those stories about that crazy kid. I just felt like I wanted to go talk to them. So I, uh, I went over and saw Dad, and we were talking, and I said, Dad, I said, how are Sam and Phil? And I, I'm getting ready to go, hey, I'm going to visit them this afternoon. And, and he said, they died a couple years ago. First it was Thelma, she got sick, and, and then, you know, Sam didn't, didn't last long after. And I told Dad, I said, you know, I was kind of thinking I'd go over and just talk to him, see if I couldn't tell him about Jesus. I don't know if they're saved. They were great people. And, and, and we, we live our lives waiting. We, wait our, we live our lives waiting for that moment that I'll actually do that. And sometimes, the opportunity passes us by. And so today, I want to pray that you dream big, dream impossible dreams. Dream that God used you to change the world. But I also want to pray that you just get the heart of a servant, that you just desire more than anything. To just let, just let somebody see Jesus in you, Lord. Let somebody see you in me. Let, let, let me make a difference in one person's life, Lord God. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I pray for this group of people, Lord, that I love, these people that, Lord, are part of the family here at New Life, Lord God. These are amazing people. But I pray right now that you just allow them to dream the dreams that you have for them. Don't let them dream, Lord God, just simply limited by their own abilities or, or limited by their current circumstances. Let them dream impossible dreams. Start reaching for them, Lord God. I pray that you begin to just let things crystallize in my brothers and sisters' hearts around this, this room right now and across the country as they watch this video, Lord God. I pray right now that they just begin to see the vision that you've got for them, for their lives. But I pray, that, Lord, more than dreams, Lord, that we would begin to like just just want to serve, just just want to serve somebody that they would just see you, that they just would see you in the midst of this dark world, in the midst of all the struggles, Lord God, when everyone's suffering from anxiety and depression and all these things that are going on, Lord God, in the midst of all that darkness, Lord, let them see in us you and the hope. That something greater than this world exists. The realization that you love them and that they see it through us, Lord. Let us shine for you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I just want to give you an opportunity. You don't have to come to this altar if you don't want to.
But you've got to make the decision. You're, you're like Ryan in eighth grade coming into the weight room. You just, you just found out that you could be part of something bigger than yourself. That you can devote yourself to really become that. If you want to make that decision, I just invite you to just ask the Lord and say, Lord, right now, I want that for my life. Lord, I want that for my life. And if you don't yet know Jesus, if you walked into this room and, and all these things sound foreign to you, let me just tell you that Jesus came and died for your sins so that you could be free, so that you could know him, and that you could find peace and healing and wholeness. And if you want that, all you got to do is ask him into your life. Just pray with me right now. If that's your Father, forgive me of my sins. Forgive me for everything I've ever done wrong, everybody I've ever hurt. I ask your forgiveness. Cleanse me. Be the Lord of my life. Be my Savior and my King. In Jesus' name, amen. If you just prayed that prayer with me, you might have come in and visited, but now you're family. And that's what this is all about. That's how all of us feel. But now, now it's time to change the world. If you need to pray, altar's open. If you need healing, come on this side. Jesus heals folks every 